to the intro. gentlemen it's episode four of the subspectrum bjj podcast there is tito's in the kombucha there is pure cbd flowing through our veins my name is jordan peitzman one person's veins or both of those no it's energy brought to you but no no free right. ads <laughs> all right this week's episode we're gonna be talking about some upcoming events in the jiu-jitsu community this week obviously we have road to adcc this weekend that is on saturday correct Saturday, uh, six awesome matches coming to you from Flow Grappling. We'll also be talking about sub, not subspectrum. We will be talking about subspectrum, but we're also going to talk about Submission Underground 25, handful of good matches at the top of that card. Um, I think they have a full undercard. I haven't seen all of the matches. I think there's only two or three matches that really have a marquee name in there. So we're going to be talking a little bit about that event, giving our uh, picks for each one of those and then also talking about some ones to look out for at subspectrum obviously some people who made our intermediate rankings some who did not make those rankings uh, some of our personal favorites that we think are going to be coming up through the ranks and potentially competing in those advanced gi and no gi absolutes in the future and then we'll see what else we end up getting into but first we're going to give her reveal the giveaway winner correct so Last week, we had essentially who was going to select the most accurate um, prediction for the Conor McGregor-Dustin Poirier mat, a fight, and it came out to be that um, Jared Appenzeller had the most accurate pick when he selected Dustin Poirier by TKO a minute 30 into round two. I was going to say, nobody picked a first-round finish, I don't think, except for one person maybe picked Conor by yeah. first-round KO. I think that's correct. Uh, so, yeah, Jared Adams other one, $25 gift card. Uh, I'll be reaching out to him, getting that all set up, and then go from there. Now, there was a close second uh, had they chose the right person. Keith Krikorian chose 57 seconds by Connor by TKO, but obviously. And he was the only one that actually did all of the things correct, right? He liked the post, shared it, posted did, it to both Facebook and Instagram. I don't know. That was that was for last week's giveaway. Oh, uh, okay. This week's so giveaway. I'm a week. I'm a week behind. Yeah. Yep. Gotcha. This week's giveaway was just comment below the winner method, a victory round time. That was all. Perfect. Perfect. I feel like there was something I was going to throw in in between the giveaway winner and the road to ADCC, but now I can't remember. Oh, I think I was just going to mention the fact that we're going to be talking about Keith coming up here pretty soon because he's competing at Submission Underground 25. Mm -hmm. I'm glad that they made a spot for him on the card. And it looks like kind of a match that's going to allow him to make a name off himself if he's able to find a submission victory. Obviously, Submission Underground's getting a little bit more notoriety now and like more attention, especially throughout the jiu-jitsu community. But they get attention on the MMA side of things, too, because Chael Sonnen is obviously such a big figure in the MMA community. So excited to see Keith on that card. and. Uh, I'm going to talk about that here in a little bit. But first, we're going to talk about Road to ADCC coming up on Saturday on Flow Grappling. Six matches coming in to you. Do you remember what time of day that is? Uh, I don't know what time it actually starts, to be honest with you. It usually is around 5 or 6 o'clock uh, time frame. And this is going to be a long event because they are using ADCC rule set, uh, but with 20-minute matches, which I think we have one, two, three, six different matches. If you just go ahead and do the math behind that, you're looking at, if they go the entire time, you're looking at two hours of nonstop. That doesn't include the entrance, cleanup, and everything in between matches. So it's going to be a long night. We're probably looking around three hours of Yeah, just matches. two hours of pure grappling. Like you said, it's, I think if I remember right on your picks, you didn't pick one single match by submission. So nope. in your mind, this does go the full two hours of grappling. And we're going to see, hopefully, a lot of action during those two hours of grappling. It's going to be interesting because, so there's a lot of implications on this. Uh, so what Mo Jassim said is that the people, the only the first and second place, are going to guarantee their invite back to ADCC, which means that... You have all the trials winners and a handful of invitationals. And he said if somebody in this Road to ADCC format 
displays a great performance that they're going to go ahead and get an invitation. So that's where you're going to have the likes of Mikey, um, where he hasn't gone ahead and won trials. He wouldn't, if he what does get a performance and has a, um, get, gets an invitation, he can skip trials. Yeah. You know, anything can happen during trials. So that's awesome that you'd be able to skip out on that. Geo, also another person who didn't medal in first or second and get first or second last time. He could get an invitation. There's a handful of those guys in here, like Nikki Ryan as well, who didn't medal, that they could earn an invitation through you know, having a great match. And that's pretty cool. Because um, I think the only people that actually applies to would be Kynan, Mateus, and maybe not Barbosa. No, Barbosa didn't make the finals. Yeah, did, did he? he oh. uh, no, he uh, lost to Gordon for th- because the finals for the 88 kilo was Gordon versus that tractor guy who was a late invite. Oh, yeah. I yeah. can't believe that he was the one that ended up making the finals at that one at 2019. I for, completely forgot about that. Yeah. So, yeah, I think the only people you're looking at are Kynan and uh, Denise who actually have guaranteed invites, obviously, back to the nat- next ADCC. But those next five matches, everybody is up for that one spot that apparently Mojo Seam says is up for for grabs we'll yep. see if that actually turns to be true if, if multiple people get invites out of this uh 10 person group um or if that's just a promotional tactic i don't know we'll see yeah i could see a few of them going ahead and getting an invite even without a stellar performance or a win here so we'll see what goes on uh with the first match what we'll have to open it up though is going to be Cade rutolo versus roberto Hoodman as both very young grapplers uh i believe typically Cade is in the 77, 66 area as far as weight, whereas Roberto is in the 88 kilos. So he is giving away a little bit of weight, but I don't think that's anything new for Cade. Uh, and then Cade is stepping up last minute, I assume because he was already planning to travel there with the other Autos guys already on the card. Mm-hmm. So um, easy for him to hop in on that spot after uh, Wiltsy dropped out. Did anybody, did you hear what the injury actually was or just that? In- he was in fact injured. I did not. I didn't even know if it was an injury for sure, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think I read that it was because of an injury, which kind of surprised me with Andrew Wilson. He seems like the kind of guy that would just grapple with a broken arm. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, he's one of those guys that just doesn't care. He'll just go out there and do whatever. Absolutely. So, so who you got for us in that Cade Rotolo versus Roberto Jimenez match? Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go. My choice is going to be Cade Rotolo by points. I think this rule set is something that uh, is going to be a huge benefit to Cade because he has the experience behind it. I think I'm, I can't remember if it was Cade losing to Nikki and Ty losing to Ethan in the trials last time that prevented them from going to 80, prevented him specifically from going to ADCC. But either both of those guys obviously had a pretty good performance at ADCC in the 66 kilo uh, bracket. So, I think this is something that Kate is very familiar with. Obviously, Roberto's a hell of a competitor, but I just think the, the training that Kate goes through with the Autos guys, they're very strategic in this format. He's going to be able to pull out the points. Gotcha. I'm going to go ahead and flip the other side of the coin and say that Roberto Jimenez finds a way to win this match, and I'm also going to say by points. I don't think either of these guys is going to find the submission against each other. That doesn't mean I couldn't be wrong, obviously. Uh, both guys are super dangerous, and both guys are pretty good finishers, um, but I am going to take Roberto by points in that first matchup of the night at Road to ADCC. Nice. Yep. So that'll be an interesting match. Uh, should be pretty exciting between the two of them. Uh, then that leads us to the Lucas Barbosa versus William Tackett. And this is supposed, it was originally supposed to be Craig Jones, who had a pull out roughly two weeks ago, maybe a week ago, with a broken hand. Uh, and then the labor placement turned out to be William Tackett. But what I would have liked to have seen is Nikki Rod versus Lucas Barbosa. That would have been a fun match because that's a match that's never happened, correct? No, it did. Did it happen at that BJJ Fanatics? That's what I was just going to say. That was the only event that I could think of that they'd ever been in the same bracket together. Yeah, and Gordon Ryan is doing everything he possibly can to antagonize uh, Hulk into doing it. And it's really funny because the comment I read from Nikki Rod is, how can you call yourself a Hulk and then say somebody's too big for you? (laughs) And he's got a point. You can't go by the nickname of Hulk. He's beating up on the little child, William Tackett. No. I mean, they're probably closer in weight than I realize, but I do think that Barbosa must have at least a you know semi significant weight advantage going into that. I match. saw him at Pans, and he's not that big anymore. Really, I don't know if he stopped praying to 
I don't know if he stopped praying to Jesus Sucked and stopped out. eating acai or uh, COVID, the, everything that went down on with the lockdown there. His, uh, his hookup was uh, no longer available. Oh, just didn't have the money to do it. <laughs> I mean, I heard that him and Hinger are washing Gordon Ryan's car for minimum wage <laughs> tips, but we'll see. We'll see. He just didn't look as big at Pan Am's, and maybe that's just seeing him more in person, but he just did not look as big as he. Typically. And that was how long ago? Uh, May. Just, just a couple of weeks? All right. That's going to influence my pick. Okay. Well, I'm choosing Barbosa by points still because we saw what Ty Rotola did to tack it yeah. on short notice. And I think Barbosa is still better than Ty. I mean, he's a medalist at ADCC. Yeah. He, he's not. And this is actually a match that I believe happened at one of the subver- sub- sub- uh, I can't even say it. subversives. A while back, uh, I believe there was the three on three, and Lucas Barbosa ended up going against William Tackett in that. And Barbosa did find the victory in that one. I know. I think it was by ref's decision. I can't say for sure. Okay. But that said, I'm going to pick William Tackett. I'm going to pick the wow. sub spectrum 185 pound champion, William Tackett, out of Austin, Texas, to take the victory over Lucas Barbosa in that second matchup of the night. That is a ballsy pick. I honestly, I honestly believe that. Um, I think Barbosa will win on points, though. I don't think I can't remember the last time Barbosa submitted somebody. <laughs> I'm going to be <laughs> honest with you. And in this format, it's such a long match, and so you start to play. And, <laughs> As you rub your temples, yeah, it's, it's such a long match. Fuck. <laughs> it, it is. It's a 20 minute match, and it's. I'm assuming it's 10 minutes, no scoring, 10 minutes scoring. And by the time that first five to 10 minutes happens in the ADCC format, I assume they're not going to be wearing shirts. Good luck locking in a submission. That is true. Let alone getting into position that is dominant. You, it's just going to be hard. So I just anticipate maybe a takedown. That would be my guess. Maybe he gets to the back. But I just see Barbosa being able to, again, the auto strategy, strategy is to go ahead and do this. Yeah. That's just what they do. They don't win a lot on submissions. I mean, they do, but yeah. So we'll see what happens. And uh, I have Barbosa by points. The next match is, gonna, is one of what I'm going to call as the match of the night. Elizabeth Clay versus Carolina Anna Vieira, or mm-hmm. Anna Carolina Vieira, one of <laughs> too many first names. What but, about that matchup is giving you fight of the night vibes? Uh, well, it's Adolfo's sister, so... That did, I, I honestly did not know. Yeah, that, I don't so, know much about Anna Carolina Vieira. I am like uncultured jujitsu swine right now when it comes to her. Haven't seen a lot of her. I just I love what Liz Clay brings to the the women's division. So. Yeah, so she's part of that uh, that team there, and she has been a huge influence for a lot of women. So I just think that both of them are going to be able to put on that insane pace. And she has a. They both have a massive rivalry with Gabby, but. Vieira's is very legitimate as like, I fucking hate this lady. <laughs> I hate it. So have that's, they faced? Yes. I'd okay. have to go back and look at what uh, all the results and what the actual uh, finishes were, et cetera, or the uh, method of victory. But uh, yeah, so that's what it is there. And they both want to be an ADCC and they're both above the 66 kilo mark with Liz typically competing at about 162. And uh, Vieira at 152, I believe. Wow. And so they have to compete against Gabby, who's going to be every bit of, what, 210, 220? She's massive. Because she's not short either. So, yeah, so Gabby looks like that. Um, have you seen Mortal Kombat? No, I have uh, not. Okay. So Mortal Kombat. One sec. I got to look at this <laughs> character's name. She looks like the guy in there with four arms. So you can go ahead and put in... Uh, Shao Kahn is a half human, half dragon race, and he has four arms. That's pretty accurate. Goro is his name. She's a Goro. beast, man. Gabby Garcia looks like Goro from Mortal Kombat. <laughs> That's if you look. If you're watching this, put them face or side by side with both their faces. Tell me they do not look the same. That's so. Anyway, sorry about the Gabby Garcia slander. Asai and Jesus. She needs to stop running from Craig Jones. Is what needs to happen. <laughs> but that match will eventually happen, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, so brought to you on pay per view. I will not. Pay I thought for it was kind of hilarious how they were like, 
going to do that match. And then literally 20 minutes before, they're like, yeah, we're going to do this on a place where we can make money to do it. I, <laughs> they yeah, were just going to put it up on like what the BJJ World TV uh, YouTube channel, I think. And I, then I, and I, they had like a press conference instead. And our wrestling match. Is that what it was? No, they ended up doing an arm wrestling match. Yeah, and Craig just let her. Yeah. <laughs> no, she beat his ass. Well, of course. Yeah. Of course. So, of course. Um, fuck Gore, Craig Jones. Yeah, fuck Craig Jones. But also fuck Gabby Garcia. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's what we're saying there. Um, the next match is going to be another very good match. For, so it, it's on paper going to be a great match, but Nikki Ryan versus Dante Leon. This, if there was a match that I f- would feel very confident in going the entire distance, I'd put all my money on this match. Really? Yeah. And I, I think that's pretty accurate because as good as Nikki's attacks are, we've seen in the last couple matches of who's number one, he's had trouble submitting his opponents. Um, and submitting a guy like Dante Leone is not going to come very easy. Yeah, and I mean... Short shorts, ADCC style. What are you going to do? Oh, yeah. He, he's a monster, too. He, he posts a lot of his lifting stuff, and that's a topic I want to get into it some point we may be able to get into tonight but he is very uh adamant and very to the, to the point with his lifting he he follows it and he posts all the shit that he does and he's a strong dude uh, yeah i see him lift he puts up massive weight so i will have absolutely nothing to say when it comes to that portion of the podcast <laughs> <laughs> but uh just an, an interesting fact is that dante leone's only been sub seven times since 2017 and of that, those seven times, um, three, <laughs> six of them were, five of the seven were either Atos or, uh, Atos or DDS. So it was Gary Tonin, uh, I believe, who was it? Oh, then, so it was Hinger We have King. a fairly, fairly uh, poorly worded version of BJJ Heroes coming at you right now. Yeah. <laughs> so it's Hinger King and Perez Wagner. Uh, Tone it all subbed in them. Kyle Bame subbed them at King. Mike Perez subbed them? Yeah. And oh. uh, outside heel hook. Really? Yeah. Where was that at? Uh, I don't remember where yeah. it exactly was. I'm going to guess Trials. Again, I could be wrong. Or poorly Kasai. worded version uh, but of BJJ Heroes. <laughs> if you remember, Matt Layton faced him. And one of those sevens, seven matches where oh, he actually yeah, he submitted him in the gi with, yeah. a, with the farm, farm bar. bar. The farm yep. bar. Yep. Hell so yeah. That's, that's the point I was getting at with that. Yep. So... With this match, I'm still picking... Uh, oh, the previous match as well. Sorry. I took Vieira by points with the match of the night. Yeah. Um, oh, and I never got to my pick. Well, I guess I did. I talked about how I, I really like what Liz Clay brings. Again, I don't know anything about Anna Carolina Vieira, but I like Liz Clay in this match. I'm going to pick her. Nice. So uh, the second or the next match that we just covered a little bit is the Nikki Ryan versus Dante Leon. I am taking Dante via points. On TV at points, and as much as I'd love to go the opposite of you, once again, I am going to also pick De- Dante. Deante. I'm going to give him a... Lay off the Peters. <laughs> yeah, no. so... Uh, Dante Leon via points in that matchup against Nicky Ryan. Yeah. The uh, fourth match of six that night. So, this match is one that I'm the most excited for. If that women's match doesn't get match of the night... This one will. It's hey, be you're one speaking of Dante versus Nikki, or are no, you talking about the next, next match that we're the about next to match we're about to gotcha. get into? And that's Mikey versus Geo. Yes. That yes. Is, Let's go. Yeah, it's gonna it, be a great match. It's gonna be exciting because neither one of them stop ever. They don't get tired. They just keep going. They never stop. And it's gonna be one of the more challenging matches for each of them. Right? Yeah. So Absolutely, Gio, they both bring kind of like a, a contrasting style. It's going to be troublesome to the others, and it'll be interesting to see who's able to get that breakthrough. Yeah, so, and, and Gio, yes, he plays the points game, but he doesn't, that's not his priority. So if he gets up on points, he's still going for the finish, right? Yeah. Whereas you'll have people that they'll get up 2-0, 4-0, whatever, and they'll, they'll not necessarily stall, They'll just show up and mm-hmm. they won't overextend themselves. Geo doesn't care. Yeah. They'll still go for the kill. And that's what's awesome about I've never watched a Geo match and be like, this is boring. Actually, I take that back. There was one. Him versus Eddie Cummings? Yes. A little bit boring, right? That yeah. was the one match I was going to bring up where I was like, well, he didn't really shell up, but he did basically just defend 
uh, Eddie's like honey hole for pretty much the entire yeah, match, that, wasn't it? Yes, I believe he, it was like almost the whole fifteen minute match. And that's the finals. Yeah, that's typically the example of the, that's best given of a guy dominating a match and then losing in overtime. Mm-hmm. And the the reason that people dislike EBI rules, myself are, being one of them. I get it. I completely get it. <laughs> so I'm going with Mikey on this by points. Mikey Mescamisi. What was I'm, that? Is that how you say it? Mesca, oh, Musamichi. Muscamichi. I don't know why. Muscamichi sounds I think, like a tie. I think, I think it's because for the longest time I mispronounced, mispronounced his name because I only had ever read it. I'd never really heard somebody say it. And you kind of just fill in the blanks if you're not really trying to uh, spell it out. <laughs> Fair enough. Yep. But uh, Mikey Musamichi, I will also take him via points in this match. Um, as much as I'd love to see one of them get the breakthrough via submission, I am going to take him by points. Hey. In our main event is two gold medalists. We have the 99 plus kilo versus the 88 kilo. Yes. And in this match, it, it's pretty big because if you look back at Mateus, he did not get a single point scored on him the entire ADCC. It's really impressive, especially and, considering that bracket at 88. Yeah. That's, I mean, he beat uh, Josh Hinger in the final. No, Craig Jones. Hinger yeah. who at third. Yep. And lost to Mateus in the semis, whereas Craig beat John Blank in the semis, I want to say. That is correct. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. So, we have Mateus Denise versus Kainan Duarte. And in this match, who are you going with? I'm going to go with Kainan Duarte in this match. Just the bigger man, um, obviously both ADCC champions. Um, Technique-wise, probably hard to differentiate between the two of them, but Kainan is obviously the bigger man. I'm going to take Kainan by points in this match. I am doing the exact same. A uh, little interesting fact. Only three people ever have submitted uh, Mateus, though. And this, is, this leads to why I choose points, right? Yeah. So they each have barely been submitted. Uh, Mateus has only been submitted by three people. It was Gordon, mm-hmm. most recently, at who's number one. Yep. And then he also was sub- submitted by Barbosa, Kynan's teammate. Oh, okay. And Marillo Santana. But here's where mm-hmm. it's interesting. Marillo has submitted him three times. Three times? Yeah. Early on, I'm assuming. Yeah. Because Marillo hasn't done a whole lot of competing as of recent. Right? No, I think his last big competition as far as with the adult division was the uh, 2017 ADCC. What a damn legend. Yeah, absolutely. How and old is he? He's got to be pretty old. Um, oh, he's... I have no idea how old he is. But he's the man behind Unity. Yep. Right. And he has the most captivating voice in all of jiu-jitsu. Really? I don't yeah. think I've ever actually heard his voice. If, if you get a chance, go listen to Morello Santana speak. And it's awesome. I <laughs> want him to narrate my life. And if I ever have a eulogy, I've never met Morello, but I want him to come to my funeral and right. speak on I'll, my behalf. I'll, uh, I'll keep that in the subspectrum budget in case Derek dies before 40. I will uh, reach out to him <laughs> while he's still available as a, a voice actor and get him to read your eulogy. <laughs> so he is 38. 38. Okay. Yeah, so he's so 30. He's not, yeah. No. So I was thinking maybe 40. but No, he was 34 at that last one. In his last um, registered competition was, oh, 2020. Wow. I take a lot of this back. Um, 2020, absolute. He beat Jonatus Gracie. He choked him out. Mm. Um, he lost the decision to Hinger. Back These are in IBJJFs. 2019. Um, or he lost to Hinger at Fight to Win. Okay. Um, a lot of them are IBJJF. But gotcha. and then he was at the 2019. I fucking knew that. He lost to John Blank at 2019. Oh, ABCC, yeah. So ignore everything I just said about Morello. But anyway, that's besides the point. And then with Kynan, he has only been submitted a handful of times as well. One of them being the illustrious. Lachlan Giles run at absolute. Yes, so, that was amazing. Yeah. So I'm going to take a pause here and plug in my laptop just to make sure. How long have we been going? 26 minutes. Feels like a lot longer. <clears throat> Anyways, 
All right, so back to the entire situation that goes on with these matches is it's hard to pick a submission uh, victory because they're not not necessarily because I believe they're going to stall or anything. It's just so hard to submit a lot of these of people. Of course, all of these guys in here are not anybody that's easy to submit, and it's the matchups, too, that yeah. make it like... It's just going to be difficult to see very many, if any, submissions in yeah. these six matches. Um, obviously, there's like all people that are, I believe, probably in the top five of the submissions. Maybe. I really don't think. There, it, yeah, I don't think there's anybody that's not in the top five of the. Division. Maybe Cade. That would be my only guess. Or Geo. Yeah. Those would be my guesses for people that aren't in the top five within their weight. Um, the only reason Gio wouldn't be in the top five is just because he's not super active, but no. um, he definitely deserves a spot in that top five because I think he's probably, I think you probably see him in at least the quarters, maybe the semifinals of an ADCC. It was tough his last ADCC because he had tough matchups. Yeah. Uh, going back to that, he just, he didn't get the, I don't want to say the luck of the draw, but he just, non favorable matchups is what I'll call them because. That, and sometimes that's just what happens yeah. when it comes to those. So I hope he's able to earn an invite through this because I love seeing him compete, especially when it comes to uh, the non-full, like the ADCC or the EBI or the fight to win, who's number one, mm-hmm. all those rule sets. So, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> last time, who did he lose to? Oh, yeah, he lost to, um, recently lost, or lost to Karina Jr. Mm-hmm. And then Mateus uh, Gabrielle at ADCC, who was a, um, oh, who's he with? Check. Check Matt, yeah. Check Matt, yeah. yeah. So, Makes one of sense. the heavy IBJJF schools. Yeah, and I know you had mentioned that Liz Clay versus Anna Carolina Vieira was your pick for Fight of the Night. Are there any other matchups that you're looking at to be super exciting or one that people should be look out for? The Geo and Mikey is going to be the second most exciting. Um, I think the Cade one and Roberto will also give it. That's the, the one that I was looking at. I think that's a match that's, that's super exciting. Roberto is almost never in a, a really boring match. Yep. And against a guy like Cade who, who brings the, the pressure and funky submissions stop. and they just are always doing something, I imagine that's going to create um, a really cool dynamic between him and Roberto in that match. Yeah. And so I'm excited to see that, which we'll see how accurate our picks are. Uh, if you have any picks out there, go ahead and let us know. Yeah, definitely drop a comment. Let us know who you think is going to win. Um, we check all of the comments every week, so you're uh, welcome to drop a comment, and we'll comment back to you. If you get a perfect, I'll go ahead and reach out to you, and I'll have a little prize for you. Ooh, Derek is made of money. i got to pay for a trip to Croatia. So <laughs> our budget is thin. <laughs> All right, next up, we got Submission Underground 25 coming up on UFC Fight Pass. That is on Sunday, as always, for Submission Underground, Sunday the 18th. Unfortunately, we lost our main event in this one. We were originally supposed to see Mason Fowler versus Kyle Bame. Yep. Obviously, Kyle Bame, we talked about a couple of weeks ago, won their absolute tournament with a victory against... Why am I drawing a blank? Was it against Pedro, Pedro. Mourinho in the finals of their absolute tournament, uh, finding a really nasty rear naked choke, <laughs> a.k.a. spinal crank in the overtime period against Pedro Mourinho, who had an awesome performance leading up to that finals match. And he is the new main event against Andy Varela. We'll obviously talk about that here shortly. Um, but first, let's get into the kind of the three main marquee matchups of the night, uh, the first of which being Edwin Najmi versus Jeremy Kennedy. And um, what do you have to say about this matchup? This, so I actually have two of these three matches ending in subs. uh, And this is one of them. I believe that this is a pretty big, I don't want to say mismatch, but I think Edwin is going to control most of it. And that's that's something that I noticed with both uh, Edwin and Keith's matches. It's like not to say that the other, these other guys don't have anything for them, but it does seem like it's set up to be a little bit of a showcase for Edwin Najmi and Keith Krikorian in those uh, two main matchups before the main event. And uh, yeah, I'm definitely taking Edwin I mean, Najmi in this, um, it, <laughs> and I, I'm taking him also by submission over Jeremy Kennedy. If if you even look at so fight to win does a betting format. Mm-hmm. And the odds that they put out are so insane that nobody in their right mind would ever make the bets. Really? So 
Edwin, just to win in any format, doesn't matter if it's by submission or by uh, overtime, he's selected to win or favored to win, excuse me, minus 1150. So you'd have oh to my God. bet $1,150 <laughs> to win $100. And to have Edwin win by submission, which is what we're choosing to do, you'd have to bet $495 to win $100. So he's a massive favorite. Yeah, that's, that's pretty crazy. I didn't, I didn't realize it was that big of a matchup, at least when it comes to the, the betting odds. Um, I'm not sure who's actually setting those betting odds, if it's Seth or if who it is within uh, the Fight to Win promotion that's doing the betting odds, but that's a pretty big disparity for, for a jiu-jitsu match especially. So... Um, would not be surprised if we do see what we both predict and see Edwin go through via submission. Yeah, so the second match of the night is going to be a close friend of mine. The uh, man. The man that got... Multi-time sub-spectrum champion. Awesome dude. Veteran. One of the best people in the sport. Yeah, Keith Krikorian versus Joey McKay. We love Keith Krikorian. In case it's not blatantly obvious at this point, I think we're both taking Keith Krikorian by, by submission seven. in this yep. match, right? I, there's, there's no other outcome in my mind because. And that brings to a, a bet. So I actually like to bet quite a bit, and I probably bet on something at least once a day. <laughs> I'm a degenerate in that capacity. So I like. If you have problems with betting, call 1-800-BETS-OFF. I mean, if you're a loser, <laughs> literally, <laughs> winners aren't calling that number. Um, so in, in this situation, you have Keith, that's a minus 275 favorite. So not as bad odds, but still not good. They're yeah. never good odds in these situations, but the, there is a bet with them that is a two to one. So if you bet $100, you'd get $200, um, that if you select or chose no overtime, Keith by submission, really. Yeah. If you chose Two Keith by odds. Mm. Keith by sub or no overtime in general. Yeah. It's not even Keith by sub. It yeah. just it says overtime, yes, minus three fifty, no overtime plus two hundred. So mm. for whatever reason a freak thing happened and Keith wasn't able to win. Yeah. Yeah. You still make it. Yep. And oddly I see this is where it gets really weird because Keith by decision is plus one thirty. Or Keith by decision plus one thirty. Yeah, so it... Okay. Weird. Yeah. They, yeah. I don't understand why those two are set that way, but it is maybe, what it is. They set the odds. Maybe I'll bet that. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I think Keith wins this match either way, especially yeah. if it goes to EBI overtime. That's obviously a rule set that he is very well I've versed never, in. Have you, uh, the only person I think we've ever seen him lose to, and this, you know, this is just me with my, again, terrible BJJ Heroes page brain, but I think the only person we've ever seen him lose to in an EBI overtime rule set was Ethan Crowlinson, and it was in that pure... EBI oh, yeah. overtime event where it was yeah. just overtime rounds, which was, and that was really a weird. weird. That Definitely was, a one-off. Yeah, it was a weird time, too, because he was in California, and they were still having the lockdown, so training wasn't as efficient as it was. not And I think he may have been injured around that time. I don't know. Yeah. Not to make okay. excuses for him, but uh, it was different, weird time. So yeah. Keith is a god in the EBI overtime formats. Absolutely. So, his back control and somebody that's personally rolled with him in just the last couple of months. He did a seminar at no coast. Um, I'm sure you probably trained with him a little bit. Uh, I believe he said on, on that Friday or whatever day that Wednesday. Was Wednesday. Yeah. During the day he trained with you and then came and trained with us at night. His back control is not something to be messed with. He, he got me with a rear naked choke a handful of times from the back. He made my nose bleed for the first time <laughs> in years. I've been punched in the nose. I've nailed my nose against things and they never bleed. Keith Krikorian gave me a bloody nose. So. Keith, but Keith is the nicest savage I've ever met. <laughs> Absolutely. And so whenever There's he, a switch he flips when he goes on the mat, and especially when he's in like a bad position or something, you see like the demon come out of there's Keith. There's a Gregorian. funny picture of him. I think it <laughs> when Nikki's get Nikki's choking him, maybe. No, it might be that. Hmm. There's a funny picture of him when he has like a snarl to him. Oh, uh, maybe like just a one off picture that's just him by himself. But yeah. I know there, there's a picture of him like when Nikki's got him in the, the finals of that ADCC trials and he looks just so goddamn determined to get out of there. Like you got to you got to root for a guy like Keith Corn. There's nothing that you could say that's bad about him. The dude tries his hardest no matter what the match is. He's always exciting. Um, obviously, I have a soft spot for him as the, the multi time sub spectrum champion. 
But uh, yeah, I think again, we're both taking Keith Corrine by sub in that one, and that leads us into our main event. Pedro Mourinho versus Andy Varela, who somebody at this table has experience competing against Andy Varela. Yeah, that was such a weird experience. That um, was. I did face Andy Varela at the ver- very first Ultimate Mat Warriors, which was put on by Boogie Martinez and Gio Martinez out in San Diego. I believe that was the second one. No, was first, it one. first one. Was it, it was a 145 one. The second Oh, okay. I don't know why I thought it was number two. Uh, but the I was supposed to be on the card originally. And then I tore my LCL, and I didn't know if I was going to have time to train. I, that know, was an incident we talked about on one of the last podcasts, right? It was from... No, we didn't talk about it? what happened with that. No, never mind. That was in the gym, actually, wasn't it? That yeah. wasn't the one that was because of... Uh, Quentin. Uh, Quentin. Yeah, yeah, this one was in the gym. You trying to samurai roll Will Harwell, right? Uh, I was inserting <laughs> my... So Will was uh, in turtle, and I was inserting my, uh, or my left hook with my leg and he sat out hard and just mm, my leg popped. I could see that. Yeah. And LCLs are just so in jujitsu. It seems like they're one of the, the ligaments that definitely just takes the most random hurt. Well, the worst part about it is I had cut from 185 to 170 because that Saturday, this was the very last roll of me cutting and competing on that Saturday of the very first sub spectrum mm-hmm. uh, at the 145, 170. I remember that. that. And I'd made way. I was good to go. I just, was chilling out and I had one last roll basically. And that's what happened as I, I cut so all that weight, all that weight to 170, man. I can't even imagine you there now. That yeah. would be scary. I yeah, could, but. I could make it now with the day before weigh-in. You think so? Yeah. Really? Okay. Cutting weight is so stupid <laughs> that I will never do that again. For the right reasons <laughs> I would, but uh, yeah. So what happened is I had to pull out of my match with, uh, I think his name is Gil. Yep. Gil. So yeah, I had my match. I had an originally scheduled a match with Gil. Didn't know when I would be back to training. So what ended up happening is that you came out yes. and took on Gil in my place. But about two weeks before we were supposed to go out to San Diego, we decided, or I decided that, you know what? If Seems I could get a match, go. I'm yeah. good to go, whatever. So I hopped out, flew out there and weighed in the day of the tournament. So I woke up at 4.30 in the morning. Uh, Des Moines time, Central time, flew out to San Diego to weigh in, face Andy that same exact day on no sleep, and I ended up losing by guillotine in like the ninth or tenth minute. You know what I hear? I hear a bunch of excuses for Derek. I lost to one of the best <laughs> tenth winner black belts. No, obviously at the time we didn't know it, yeah. but. He's a motherfucker, right? Yeah. He's really, he's really good, and uh, he's put him, uh, got you know, kind of built up a name for himself at Submission yeah. Underground. They seem to really like him. I think Chael likes him. Heather obviously uh, keeps bringing him back as the matchmaker. So uh, obviously a big opportunity for him in the co, or not the co-main event, the main event of this one. I think the only other time that he main evented uh, Submission Underground was when he faced um, Mason Fowler. <laughs> Right, for the yep. championship, and I believe Mason got him with a rear naked choke in overtime. He was not able to submit him. Or was, was it, it in re- was I it thought in it regulation? was in regulation. It might have been in regulation. I've just seen the, the clip of uh, Mason talking over it, so I just know it was a rear naked choke. I can't remember if it was regulation or not. But either way, who are you going with in that finals? Sorry, not finals match. Main event match between Pedro Mourinho of Gracie Baja and Andy Barela of 10th Planet. He did win in overtime, by the way. Was in overtime. Yep. Um, okay. I'm going with Pedro in overtime. That's Pedro my... in overtime. Yep. Yes. Um, if this was any other rule set, of, you know, we, we were talking about road to ADCC. So for some reason, my mind was on points. I was thinking Pedro by points. That's obviously not possible. Um, five minute round in submission underground. Just don't see him getting it done against Andy Varela in that five minute nope. period. He's a hard guy to submit, and especially in a five minute period, um, he does. He's not going to get tired during that five minutes. He's nope. going to move the entire time if necessary. Um, but I will also take Pedro Mourinho in overtime. Um, I would imagine at least somewhat bigger than Andy, but I, that could be wrong. Yeah, I think I know Varela is typically around the one seventy ish. Yeah, and that I sounds know about Pedro right. Pedro is probably like more like one eighty five, but. Maybe Andy cuts to 170. So it could be closer as far as weight goes. Obviously, that's not a huge factor, but uh, we're both taking Pedro Mourinho in overtime in that uh, main event matchup of yep. Submission Underground 25. That's on Sunday on UFC Fight Pass. Um, I'm definitely going to be watching it. 
you yeah. watching it on Sunday. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'll be there. I'll get a stream. Sorry, Dana. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to pay for UFC Fight Pass just for submission underground. That's literally the only reason that I pay for it. And it's I started paying for it back when I used to do uh Fight Companions with Raf. Yeah. Um he used to do them pretty Fuck regularly. Raph. Hey, how dare you? I like Raf Asparza. We weren't making fun of you before the cameras turned on. I promise, Raph. <laughs> but uh yeah i used to uh, do fight companions with raf with raf and um those are actually with, a really good time with riff raf yeah riff raf <laughs> <laughs> no those are actually a good time man i appreciate those uh those opportunities to get on on a mic and just be talking about jujitsu in general getting a chance to break down matches raf obviously um has done a handful of like improv events he's that's actually the only time he's ever been to iowa was he did like a improv event here. Um, but yeah, I guess he used to do all kinds of stuff like that. But then he's got his own, um, you know, he's on a TV show on NBC. He's on his own podcast with the verbal tap. So um, he's got a lot of practice, like shelling questions to people and like doing a good job of like involving you in the conversation. So I've always appreciated the practice that I get talking to Raph on his podcast. I will give him a shout out because he did send me a shirt to Hulk Hogan the next time I am doing ADCC style. Nice. So the next time I go to have a shirtless match, like our boy Preston would love to see from episode one <laughs> next time i have a shirt by the way i commented back to him and i was like you like this huh and he said like i can't remember what it was just like yeah with an exclamation point like, <laughs> he is he is so excited yeah about you and mahmoud's shirtless match next time i do sub spectrum that's all i'm doing is shirtless so yeah. i don't even need a rash card are we gonna see you on august 14th or not this time around uh, i depends honestly it depends how i feel because the next two weeks i have competitions and trying to sprinkle three out of four weekends with competitions a little rough yeah so we'll see how i feel after ibjjf uh phoenix which is interesting because you're doing ibjjf while you're down there too so fight to win and ibjjf i oh i I (laughs) so i'm doing fight to win phoenix supposed to be um i don't know my pony yet and all that. It's so, supposed to be next Friday, right? So we're next eight. Saturday, sorry. Oh, Saturday sorry. or next the Friday. Nine days after. removed. Yeah. yeah. But come on, Seth, what are you doing? That I mean, that's not the first time it's happened to yeah. uh, he I think it was August of twenty nineteen. They did another one down there and they didn't have the fight card put together until like three or four days before. Really? The, oh so. man, I'd be so stressed trying uh, to do that, but I don't well for him yes as a a competitor i don't care because if you really think about it if i go to a tournament i don't know who i'm facing first round until the day of typically yeah or the day i'd just be worried that like the event wasn't going to happen and i was just going to fly out or travel you know i had plans to travel out to somewhere but if you're already out there for something anyways um then it's not a huge deal to you i suppose yeah they're doing back-to-back weekends so i'd find it really hard for them to be like ah you know what we're canceling this so i don't foresee that but yeah so i should be uh on the fight to win either the 24th or the 30th uh as far as the day i think my preference is the 24th so that's the one i'm aiming for so there's two in phoenix yeah back to back weekends back to back weekends that's amazing that they're able to do that there is a large jiu-jitsu community because they can also steal from the california and texas yeah people and Colorado. Yes, that's true. I mean, if you're able to Vegas. mix it up, I mean, because it's, but it's just the thought that, you know, they have a mostly local card. So it's like, you'd imagine you would, you know, I guess if the, the scene's big enough, you might be able to put together 40, because I think they do like 40 matches now, right? 40, Something 45 like that. matches. 30 to um, 40s. It's a lot of local matches to put together. And it's amazing that they would be able to do back to back weekends where people are like, yeah, I'll pay $50 to go watch some jiu jitsu matches. But now I may be breaking. That's cool. I mean, I hope we get to that point somewhere or at some time here in Des Moines where we could have, you know, events multiple times a month or at least every other month or something um, and just make jiu jitsu more of a marquee thing and something that people are interested in going out and checking out. And I may be spilling the beans on this and it's just through research, more or less. But when I go to fight to win, they're able to um, buy tickets for whatever fighter, right? Mm-hmm. You can select, like, I want this commission to go to whoever. Oh, so yeah. for this yeah. event, they have both John G. and Victor Hugo on there. 
So they may be there as well. Oh, okay. So I may be breaking news. You heard it here first. They put the information out there. We broke it. How could we they found not? it. They haven't even announced any matches for that whatsoever, though? Not that I'm aware of. Really? Nine days out. That's insane. Yeah. Oh, well, geez. they didn't announce. We were doing the pre-production on this, and we are talking about topics, and they hadn't put out the card on Monday or Tuesday for this week. Yeah. So that's Is just that how they operate. Is that still the case? No, it's out there, but I'd have to go back, and I didn't... Oh, yes, yeah, so that was uh, Kendall Ruzings competing on that yep. one. And obviously, we'll see her coming up on the uh, both the gi and no gi women's advanced uh, absolutes coming up at Subspectrum on August 14th. Um, one of the biggest female competitors we've ever had on any one of our events. So I'm super excited to have her and her little sister, Emma, who uh, just won a gold medal and a, a bronze in the absolute at the blue belt, I believe, at American Nationals. She'll also be competing in our women's advanced no-gi absolute. So look out for both of them. They've said if they do end up facing in the finals for some reason, uh, that they will do a real fight and it won't be like a, a fake fight. So we'll see what, what happens with that. We might have some sister-on-sister -sister looking beatdowns. So one thing to consider with the Pedro Marino match, and I didn't Going realize, all the way back to Submission Underground 10 minutes ago. Fight to win <laughs> 177 this Friday. Pedro faces Davi Ramos. Oh, I did. I forgot about that match. Yeah. That's a fun matchup. Yeah. That's so, really fun. Davi Obviously, is a Davi, a uh, former ADCC champion. Yeah. Um, he's got that famous flying armbar, I believe, at, I want to say 2015 yep. ADCCs. Um, I don't even remember who it was against. I just remember at the time I was like pretty new in the jujitsu scene. I started training in like late 2013. So at that point, I'd only, I was maybe a blue belt at that time. Um, and that was just like insane to see somebody in the finals of ADCC with a flying arm bar. Like, that was insane. Cause yeah. then you saw all sorts of people trying <laughs> that exact <laughs> against thing. the seated guard. And yeah. then a lot of people got leg locked. I'm pretty sure it was Lucas <laughs> Lepre. Was it? Yeah. Damn. That's not an easy man to beat, especially nope. with a flying arm bar in the finals of ADCC. It's Davi cool. Ramos, a fucking beast, man. Yep. So that's, just one of the matches out there. Lovato also has a match, but I don't know get the guy he's facing. So, yeah, so that's actually a pretty fun card to, to compete on. Usually yeah. a lot of times with fight, fight to win, you only see in like maybe one, sometimes two like matches that like the general jujitsu community is going to give a shit about. Um, so cool to see them have like three, you know, I think you've mentioned three matches that even I just sitting here yep. was excited about. So cool to see all of that happening in Phoenix and that you get a chance to compete. Uh, on that this card is this weekend at, in Houston. This Friday. Oh, okay. So, never mind. I'm completely off I'm not topic on then. Card. Gotcha. Well, then fuck you, man. You didn't get the chance. You're going to be on a card full of nobodies. No one's going to give a shit or watch. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, again, that was like a 10-minute tangent on top of the Submission Underground 25. But that wraps up everything that we have to say about them. Um, they say that potentially the matchup between Kyle Bame and Mason Fowler could happen as soon as their next event, but obviously they, they usually start announcing things for their next event once their last event has cleared up. They're not planning multiple events out at the same time. So we'll just have to wait and see how things shake out on Sunday, and then obviously they'll start announcing some of those matchups that are coming up. Yep. So we'll see what happens there. Uh I have to reach out to a contact that's close with Chael and get a little bit of information, but there may be other big things happening with them in the coming months. So, what, you know, anything, anything you can hint at here? I I have to women's double check. No. Women's match? No, I, no, I'm not not a women's match that I'm aware of, but I'll double check to make sure it's still a possibility. It was something that was a possibility in the past, but if this does get announced. We'll pop this back up, and this is exactly what we're talking about. So, I hope it's a Keith Krikorian 155-pound tournament. I, I wanted to do a tag team match with Keith. That would we be both, awesome. We, both, we fit it because he's about 160 right now, and I'm about 190, so we fit that 350. Yeah. I wanted to do a tag team match. Why would match. he choose you, though? No, well, I don't know. <laughs> no reason to actually choose me. There's a bunch of other black belts and brown belts and even other purple belts you could choose <laughs> I'm just, just because man. I'm not but yeah man. especially out at uh, Studio 84 where he's at now yes, John in, Combs uh, you yeah, tag team with New, yeah out in New Jersey man he's got a nice little uh, crew that they're building out there Jay Regabuto um, putting together some pretty awesome black belts and uh, giving them an opportunity to teach at some of those schools out there um, 
that was the reason that Keith stopped through. Obviously, he was on a road trip out to the East Coast to, to start his new life in New Jersey, teaching at, I believe, at Studio 84 Squared. Yes. Um, and gave us a seminar along the way. So I'm excited to see things that are things are up and running for him. He's teaching, I believe, some leg day classes and things out there. Obviously, pretty much no gi. I don't think the kids, I don't think I've ever seen Keith put so on a gi head. Here's the funny. <laughs> here's a funny story. Is that Wednesday he stopped in? Yeah. It was supposed to be a gi day at Hensel Gracie Des Moines. Oh, yeah. And I had got a gi out for him and everything. And he's getting ready to get changed, all of that. And then Carson's just like, ah, no gi. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, Carson, I want to see this. <laughs> that would have been pretty funny. Yeah. Keith's fun to roll with, man. That was like, you know, the roles that we had, those are some of the best roles that I've had in months. And I was like, fuck, man, I wish I had somebody like that that I could just go with all the time. I got to watch him. I feel like in 12 minutes or whatever it was that I rolled with him, like I got like six months worth of six months worth of training in right then like just how much i learned about what actually works in my game and what doesn't work what i need to be better at defending because uh he was just a monster getting on my back he uh i gotta watch him and karsten roll Ooh, that was yeah awesome i bet yeah so yeah. that was that was you did you watch those two go and you're like oh shit i will never be this good at jiu-jitsu yeah just like well i guess i'm still gonna try yeah we can get there. No. We can get there. Okay. But, <laughs> but by the time we get there, they're going to be 10 yeah. miles ahead of us. Yeah. That's just the way jiu-jitsu works. So. Exactly. <laughs> but that goes, you know, obviously, bunch of tangents talking about everything going on with Submission Underground, but that actually does wrap up what we're going to be talking about with that. Uh, next event coming up, we'll see after Sunday. But ones to look out for. That's the next thing we're going to get into with Subspectrum. We've obviously got our summer showdown coming up on August 14th. Um, there's five cash prize brackets. Overall, it's a gi and no gi round robin tournament for kids, teens, adults, masters. There's going to be a sweet auditorium venue that we're using just right down the hall from us here at Franklin Junior High. Could seat 5,000 if we wanted to. Again, probably not going to fill up that much. But over the coming years, this is an event that I, I expect to grow into something special. Like I think at some point we're going to hit 500 competitors. And I think we're going to hit 1,000 competitors. Like some of those events that you're seeing for Grappling Industries in Denver. Um, I believe Reno is another place where they have like super big events where they get like 1,000 plus competitors. Um, and that's something that I'm excited to build here in Des Moines. And I think that this venue allows us to potentially do that, uh, potentially work into a two-day event, four mats down on the floor in the auditorium venue, and then up on an elevated stage, full production. We'll have two brand new mats from Fuji Mats. We have the Advanced Absolutes and our feature men's 125-pound championship going on on one of the mats. And then on the second match on the stage, we'll be having all of the advanced weight brackets uh, throughout the day and we'll see depending how many advanced weight brackets there are we might bring up some of those intermediate matches uh, to the the elevated stage and that's where we're going to talk about ones to look out for people at subspectrum and the intermediate ranks that could potentially start making a name for themselves here in the midwest jiu-jitsu scene and eventually climbing themselves up into our advanced absolutes um, and once they win an advanced absolute at Subspectrum, you never know the sky could be the limit, right? We've seen William Tackett and some of the other people that we've had at Subspectrum in much, much bigger events on Flow Grappling. We saw him and we talked about him in the Road to ADCC event. Um, so, you know, I'm not trying to, to toot my own horn or anything like that, but I do believe that at some point Subspectrum is going to be a place for grapplers to make a name for themselves and to give themselves an opportunity to work themselves up to those bigger events that have more notoriety in the jiu-jitsu community. Um, we're going to be the middleman to show them everything that's going on here in the Midwest and try to, to, to put some names on some of these people. So obviously a couple of weeks ago, we had re-released our intermediate men's pound for pound rankings. And we're going to talk about a handful of people on those actual rankings, but also going to talk about some people that are off of those rankings. Um, and the first two that I'm going to start to mention is two guys out of Pedigo Submission Fighting, two guys that have helped with the event. Super, super uh, cool dudes. Uh, everybody at Pedigo has been super friendly when they've come out. They're awesome. Uh, Jared Schaefer, a 17-year-old kid out of Pedigo Submission Fighting, moved there, I believe, about a year ago from Indiana. And yep. uh, just a young kid making a name for himself at the Blue Belt ranks. Funny thing about him, he used to train with Longboard Joe. 
Really? Where at? In Indiana. Really? Yeah. Small, small world. Longboard Joe makes his third appearance third on the fourth. podcast. He oh, might. another update. Kurt still hasn't got me with a buggy choke. <laughs> Fuck you, Kurt. <laughs> That's funny. Um, and we're obviously going to be talking about a couple of your other teammates that are at the bottom of the top 10. But uh, before we get to that, uh, we also have Michael Pixley out of Pedigo Submission Fighting. He is a D, no, not D1. Uh, he is an NAIA national champion out of Grandview, which is a local NAIA college here in Des Moines. Um, I think he's originally either from Missouri or Illinois, I can't say for sure, but made his college career here in Des Moines at Grandview, and we've seen him compete a handful of times at Subspectrum. He's 6-0, and maybe 5-0 and in his intermediate-ranked matches, um, and he actually has a couple wins over some advanced belts, too. He, at the time, I believe, only had like six months of jiu-jitsu training, but obviously uh, insane wrestling pedigree. And he submitted a couple of purple belts with some darses in our intermediate 205, or maybe it was 205, or might have been 230-plus, actually, because it got combined up. That's just the way it worked that day. And he was like, move me up, man. I'll take it. Um, and some really, really impressive victories. Foot sweep out of this world, man. I did not realize he was behind that viral video that came out from Grandview a few years ago. It was like, Fat Kid Explodes. Really? And they're actually wrestling in the dining hall at Grandview. It's like 12 o'clock or, you know, like one in the morning. They're probably drunk, coming back from the bars. But he's wrestling with this, like, kind of fat kid. And he arm drags him, pulls the arm across. And then as the kid's stepping away, kicks his legs out from him. And the kid's feet fly in the air. Oh, and no. he hits the ground. And it looks like or they, they like, edited it over with a, a nuclear bomb. But I've seen that video, like, hundreds of times. It's okay, popped I've up on my it. feet a bunch of times. And I remember a bunch people like uh because i had a, a handful of friends that wrestled at grandview as well and they would uh bring it up and talk about it but i had no clue until a few weeks ago when they posted on the pedigo submission fighting uh youtube which is freaking awesome by the way you guys should check that out george valadaris and uh the crew at pedigo is doing an awesome job with that youtube channel like coming out with content pretty much every single day so I would definitely check that out. But uh, I didn't realize until they put out a video a couple of weeks ago, Michael Pixley actually was breaking it down. He's like, you might know me from the viral video. <laughs> and I'm like, I knew it was a Grandview, but I had no clue it was Michael Pixley. So that's, that's kind awesome. of funny to find out. Grandview is an absolute powerhouse when it comes to wrestling. It's insane. Um, they basically get all of the students who can't make the grades at all of the bigger schools here in Iowa. So then they end up getting recruited. Like, I swear they have like a list. They're like, Guys who failed out at Iowa. So they, but, you know, obviously they've built a name for themselves and then now brought in other guys. I'm not saying Michael Pixley was a dropout of, of any of the bigger colleges, but. Um, they signed a two-time Olympian. Really? Yeah. Who's that? Ben Provisor. Provisor. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's 30 years old. <laughs> oh, holy shit. Yeah. How? So, How? And, so this is what's great about NAI. To be wrestling against 18 year olds. Yeah. Being the absolute shit out of them. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It, it's fucking hilarious. But NAI doesn't have the same eligibility as the NCAA. Yeah. So he can sign with them as a freshman. That's so insane. Four years. Two time Olympian and senior <laughs> Greco national champion. That's awesome. I remember hearing about this. I obviously don't know much about wrestling or wizards, to... wizards in the recruiting game. Yeah. Apparently, <laughs> do you still have eligibility? <laughs> You're out in Tokyo right now, recruiting people. Do you have eligibility? How old are you? All right, Grandview next year. We you want to come to Iowa? How do you feel about corn? Yeah. How do you feel about potentially getting Parkinson's disease from herbicides? I don't know. I saw a sponsored ad for that today, and it kind of made me scared because it was like a plane driving over a. A field and man, I used to see those all the time growing up. Iowa, my grandpa has Parkinson's, so I'm like, explain. To I know we just had to get dark for a second. You know, I, we were well, talking about some ones talk to about, look out for, and now we're getting dark. Parkinson's disease. One. All right, so if you ever come out and compete in Iowa, don't drink the tap water. Don't go near the water. It's disgusting. It's not clean. Drink from a well growing up. Probably explains a lot. Though. It explains everything. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, next up, another guy from our rankings. And I know tomorrow I'm going to get a bunch of messages. They're like, this guy is below me on the rankings. And you talked about him, but didn't talk about me. These are just guys that personally, whether it's their coaches, whether it's their performances, um, whether it's just the fact that I was looking at the mat that they were competing on. These are the guys that have stuck out to me. And these are the guys that I'm going to talk about. If I haven't heard of you yet. 
keep showing up and make me make me know your name, right? Remember, uh, but, he might have Parkinson's. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Dante Rodriguez out of Kearney Combat Sports, he was a, I believe, I don't think he was an All-American, but I believe he was an NCAA qualifier at Iowa State a handful of years back, maybe at even 125, as low as that. He might have been 133, but I believe he was a 125-er. Um, but he's been competing. I think he just competed at actually one of our events, but he won all of his matches. Uh, I believe three fourths of them or so by submission. And he's another guy that I'm looking out for. Um, he just, from what I've heard, Alex uh, Weaver puts in a lot of, a lot of good words about him, but he's just in the gym all the time. He's always getting better. And obviously as somebody with a high wrestling pedigree and somebody that's already gone through the grind of being an NCAA athlete, um, if they're committed to being good at jujitsu, then obviously they're going to be able to find their way into, um, you know, some some good victories. And if he's close to subspectrum, that's somebody that I'm going to talk about. I don't know if you got a chance to catch any of his matches at the last event. I did not. I believe a lot of front chokes. I know. That sounds I know there was one match where uh, the the referee wasn't sure if they should call it a crank, and it was a Dars. I'm like, a lot of front chokes are going to turn into a crank as long as it's not a blatant crank from the back that you're pushing the chin across the face and just face cranking or finishing the face on the face or over the jaw, then we're not going to call it in the intermediate ranks. Advanced, all bets are off. <laughs> all bets are off. Yeah. So with that said, I'm going to put the name out there for three people from Henzo's. Three people? Three. Okay. On my list, I have two people yeah. that I thought you'd so talk about. I have a third one. Yeah. That Is it Longboard Joe? The, no, he's not going to do that. <laughs> okay. He's doing IVGF Masters World, so, uh, nice. so he's getting prepped for that. Gotcha. Um, and he just had a kid, so he's re- getting back into training right now. So, and, um, The three are going to be Ross Nelson, who does every single subspectrum and gets as many matches as he possibly he can. Always com- I think I actually was looking at it, and I think he's competed in four divisions at every single event over the last year, which... Coming up on this event, if he does this one, all four events, that means 20 divisions in one year within subspectrum, which is pretty yeah. amazing. And at a very popular weight class and a popular division. 170 or 185, typically. One, yeah. And then either beginner, <laughs> intermediate, white belt, blue belt. Yep. Massive as he, as Because he recently got his blue belt there at Henzo's, correct? Yes. Yep. He was training with us for February, a while at January. No Coast and then switched over similar time uh, during COVID over to Henzo Gracie with you and uh, seems to have found a nice little home for himself over there. Yeah. I, yeah. Uh, the second person is going to be Jake. Jake Puddins. What is that? This is. His shirt. That's his shirt. Like yeah. he owned it, or no? I'm not wearing like Jake's shirt. Okay, that's <laughs> uh, his, his his logo. His okay. logo and promotion, I suppose. Oh, well, free ad for Jake. Um, We're gonna yeah, have to trade so, shirts. I'll wear one of those. That looks like a nice shirt. He, he already so they're um, limited release only. Oh, of and, J- and Jake does not go back. He's and, a businessman. Yeah. Look at him. So uh, he's like the Scheuer roll of weightlifting tees. <laughs> <laughs> he. Uh, He's going to be a, such a pain in the ass coming, for, coming up. He's also doing Masters Worlds, but in Subspectrum, he's going to do amazing because his only loss was to Lane where he, there was a point issue where you just like, oh, that's a point kind yeah. of thing. That's how points work, et yeah. cetera. Well, and, in, I mean, at the time, he was probably, what, 12 months of training? No, it was February, it's so it would have been eight months. That's insane. Um, and then he ended up avenging that loss. And then his other loss was to that big ass Lawrence Phillips. Yeah. And Lawrence passed his guard and that was it. Yeah. So Jake's, Jake's gotten, gotten so much, much better and he's such a pain in the ass for me to deal with. He really is. Um, and it's not just cause he's strong. Like he knows what he's doing too. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I'm glad that. Uh, Carson, Carson, I don't know if it's, it's Carson specifically or if you're working with him, but I'm not doing shit with him. Okay, I was gonna say he's he's getting the game figured out. I don't. I, I try and avoid teaching Jake, Jake techniques <laughs> all I can. So uh, he's my he's typically my drilling partner. Yeah. And Carson will come over while we we're drilling and like correct something or like you can also do this. I'm like fuck you, Carson. Stop showing him these things. He's gonna be like Thanos with a gauntlet and snap. After he gets all these techniques, he's just gonna snap and we're all screwed. Um. The third person. Can you imagine him getting an uncontested Kimura on somebody? It obliterates. It's, oh, yeah. It it's, goes to it's, dust. It's not Hannah Sharp, Sandy Rojo. It's, oh, my God. The, Carson's the bone just. 
Yeah. It's what? It's that's Carson's teammate. You know. Oh yeah. 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 It was a uh, beast, man. I wish she would come out for the absolutes, but uh Duck Jitsu told me that she's not much into absolute divisions. So yeah. we won't see her on August fourteenth, unfortunately. But uh in the future we do plan to host a one women's one hundred and forty five pound division. I great. think we'll uh, definitely see her out for that one as a, a return champion she was our 135 pound champion about two years ago on that subspectrum seven card March that we saw tex johnson and matt layton as the main event <laughs> that um, was a mo- and we saw juni acacia win our men's 135 pound champion so from like a, a name recognition perspective that was one of the biggest subspectrum events we also saw keith gregorian take that victory over john battle um so those four matches are you know those those the four that i just mentioned obviously marquee names in the jiu-jitsu community now yeah, and then you also had Hunter Colvin in there, and then you had um, oh yeah Adam Bradley in See, that's there. That's a, a match that I literally forgot about because the something with the cameras messed up during that match, and like we didn't catch all of it. Oh. I don't understand why. I got some uh, poorly worded excuses, but yeah, we didn't catch a whole lot of the Hunter Colvin versus Adam Bradley match, which was actually a pretty exciting match. Was it? Did those two face each other? Yeah, okay. Hunter Colvin versus Adam Bradley was like the. Uh, Right below the co-main event okay. on that card that night. That so that match with Tex and Matt was the funniest thing I've ever seen in my life. And Jiu Jitsu <laughs> Tex literally just Tech. runs at Matt, yeah. and throws his body at him. Yeah, I, mean, I feel bad for Matt because Matt like was not prepared for that. You know, yeah. like you're coming out there, uh, slap hands, bump fists. And all of a sudden, this bowl is charging you. And <laughs> what the fuck do I do with There's this? There's some pictures, and it's like, or even like videos where it's like straight across, like where Matt was standing, just looking at Tex. Tex looks like a psycho, man. He is even, a psycho. He literally told me. I remember we were riding in the U Haul on the way to, to the venue. It wasn't like actually to the event, but like the night before, because I was driving him around to his hotel and stuff. He said, I want to break Matt's tip fib. <laughs> just like with a straight face, like not even laughing about it. Just, I want to break his tip fib. Like, all right, that's a different type of dude. <laughs> Absolute psycho. And then our third, so we're going to transition away from that to the third person who just started training with us. Yeah. Joe Scantlin. Joe Scantlin. Scantlin. He, oh, ICU yeah. Rep, ICU wrestler. ICU wrestler. Yeah, he was he, down at Des Moines Jiu-Jitsu for a while, yeah. right? Yeah, he was another guy that was really tough to deal with. I haven't rolled with him in a really, really long time. But uh, I think I probably rolled with him back when I was like a blue belt, purple belt, and he was a motherfucker to deal with. And it's and now that he's you know now that you're training under somebody like Karsten, who just fantastic (laughs) instructor, man. Like every time I go over there, I learn great things from Karsten, things that I take away and that I'm like completely change my game or completely change an aspect of my game or a particular submission that I just thought I understood, and now I'm like, oh, now I know what I'm actually supposed to be doing. Um, Awesome, yeah. Day in, day out. Today I trained with them. I, I mean, I trained with them five, six days a week. So. Yeah. Awesome to have Carson in, uh, in the Des Moines Jiu-Jitsu community. That's uh, one of the greater additions. And just as the sport continues to grow in the state of Iowa, just seeing somebody like that uh, black belt from the West Coast out in, I believe, Portland or yep. the, out in Oregon, um, who decided he, he wanted to move to Des Moines. I think it just worked out that he had some family like in Omaha and like Milwaukee or something Madison. like that. Madison. So his Madison. So. His wife's family's from Omaha and then his family, he's originally from Madison. Yeah. So he just wanted to situate himself somewhere in the middle. Obviously there is a huge opening for the market of jujitsu in Des Moines. And that's even something I talked about in uh, my interview with Matt Layton. That was one of the reasons that he moved from the Chicago area to Eastern Iowa under John Gutta was he just saw so much opportunity. Um, and, and obviously that's something that I see in subspectrum throughout the, the Midwest. Um, but specifically here in Des Moines, Iowa, that there's just so much opportunity in this city for jujitsu to grow and become a big, big thing and a big community of people. Um, you know, we had a decent MMA community back in the like early 2000s when Militich was going on out there in the Quad Cities area. Um, and I think we can kind of build off of that and create a, an even better, more positive, hopefully, jujitsu community here in Des Moines. And that's something I'm excited about. Yeah. So that, that, those are three that I'm going to be bringing to the table as far as uh, people to watch, especially with this. Uh, the ne- upcoming subspectrums. I don't know if Jake's going to be there now uh, because he is also going to Croatia uh, with you. Not not with me, but at the same time as me. Oh, okay. So interesting. We're both going to Croatia. He's going with his girlfriend. They're going to go 
do whatever. Oh, cool. And I'm going to be out there just lurking around. So we uh, <laughs> have any viewers in Croatia. Zagreb. Yeah. So uh, come see me, I guess, or let me know of any jiu-jitsu spots out there to go check out. Awesome. And then I had a handful of people who did not make the rankings, um, particularly from a gym that we had mentioned throughout the podcast and also somebody who we visited in the coming or not the coming weeks, in the last few weeks at Citadel BJJ, uh, two guys that are coming up in the intermediate ranks, two blue belts, I believe, uh, the first of which is Michael Fish. Um, he's somebody that I noticed at the last subspectrum. He had like a, a crazy triangle. I can't remember exactly how it happened, but there's a ton of pictures of it. Uh, Principal Johnson captured a handful of those photos um, that we have to this day. Um, but he recently won a gold medal at the uh, Chicago IBJJF, obviously training under a really great group out there with Jim Kelly and Matt Layton at Citadel BJJ, uh, working with the kids out there. Um, just somebody that I see a lot of potential in at C Citadel BJJ and uh, somebody that I see making some waves in the, the upcoming months in the subspectrum intermediate rank divisions. And then also somebody else that uh, came across my radar when I was doing the rankings. He didn't quite make the rankings. I didn't do an on the edge for the intermediate rankings. Um, but if I did, he and Michael Fish probably both would have been in that on the edge uh, portion of the rankings. Just those few people that are just that close to being at number 10. And that's Brett Velasquez. Um, I didn't know this until Jim Kelly posted about him this week, but he's a four time high school state champion out of Nebraska. Uh, he right. won a D2 national title, I believe, at St. Cloud. So now with the group at Citadel BJJ, uh, obviously they've got a great uh, dynamic or dichotomy with the wrestling of Jim Kelly, uh, somebody who's worked closely with the Hawkeye Wrestling Club, Tom and Terry Brands, and everybody that's you know amazing at wrestling in the Iowa City area. And then you have a legitimate black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and that's Matt Layton, somebody that we talked about earlier in the episode. Uh, with a submission victory over Dante Leon, been in matches against guys like Tex Johnson. He actually, I believe, has a submission victory over Tex Johnson in the Gi at a, a fight to win event before he he took that submission loss at Subspectrum. Um, so a guy that we talked about, Brett Velasquez, obviously uh, somebody that I'm looking to to also make some waves in the intermediate ranks. He also won a, a gold medal at the IBJJF in Chicago this past Saturday. Um, and we can talk a little bit about that event too. There's obviously some pedago guys that did super well out there. Um, but he, this Brett Velasquez guy, I think he has a victory 33 to zero at subspectrum. 33? 33 to zero and another match 20 to zero. So that's insane. So the thing to consider with that, in IBGGF, it's less impressive. Granted, 33 points. Because you can lot. stack points pretty easily. And right? it's seven minutes, yeah. right? Seven minutes, 33 zero, that's fine. But at subspectrum, that's insane, mainly because it's three minutes. Like, yeah, the final yeah, three minutes yeah. of the match. I, like, I personally, didn't, I know the rule set, and I didn't yeah. even think about the fact that he's scoring 33 points in the final three minutes that's of the match. Insane. Yeah. That, that shouldn't happen. Like, I wish we had the video of that match. When I just saw that on Smooth, I was like, 33 to zero? Like, what did he do? He just, because, you know, he's a really good wrestler. What do you do? Take him down, let him up, take him down, let him up. Like, I've seen that. I've seen a lot of guys tech fall each other that way in high school, um, particularly a guy that has also worked out with or worked with our events. Uh, he was like the table man at our event back in maybe November. I can't remember February, maybe. Uh, Trevor Volker, just super lanky, strong dude, crazy mindset. Uh, I think he used to like run home from football practice. He lived out in the country like five minutes from, or not five minutes, five miles from practice or from the place where we practice at. And he would run home every day. Um, crazy wrestler, but that's what he used to do. Take people down, let them up, take them down, let them up. Um, but I really am curious how he, he was able to accumulate 33 points in that um, three minute period. So maybe if you've got the video, Brett Velasquez, send that to me because I would love to post that on the subspectrum page. That's just, Poor guy, whoever he <laughs> faced. Yeah. So, uh, that I is there anything on the IBGF Chicago you really wanted to cover? Um, I, I mean, I want to just mention the Pedago guys. Obviously, they've been a big part of our events over the last year, and some guys that uh, you know I have a lot of good things to say about. But uh, George got the quadruple gold. I think it was his first tournament as a brown belt, and he was able to capture. Not only four gold medals, but I believe he posted that he earned submission victories in each of those finals victories. 
Um, so to be able to do that in his first appearance as a brown belt at uh, the IBJJ of Chicago, so amazing. He, and um, so just he did proves, masters. That I'm not sure about. Because if he did quadruple gold, couch, double gold. That is true because he was yeah. brown belt. So yeah, he must have done masters one. At least for one of them. Yeah. I didn't realize he was 30. Yeah, they mentioned it in the last episode that he's Did they? he turns 30 later this year or something. Oh, okay. I was like, fuck. Oh, he got his brown belt. I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Soon enough, though. Soon enough. We'll uh, see. We'll see like two years. But yeah, quadruple gold for George. Uh, couch, obviously. Double gold. Um, getting gold in this division and then gold in the absolute. Um, nothing but good things to say about that dude. Um, I posted a video of him winning our absolute back in November. And he just looks so happy. He looks like genuinely happy to win $500 at a tournament in the middle of a cornfield in Des Moines, Iowa. He, uh, you know, as somebody who's kind of made a name for himself and, and become a character on the Daisy Fresh show and somebody that a lot of people like, it's funny to see the, the comments on our YouTube channel. Sometimes people will uh, comment on one of the matches that he lost, like the one to Austin. And they, they, first of all, they can't believe that he lost. And then second of all, they are like so genuinely sad that he lost. They're like, I can't, it hurts me so much to see a guy like Jacob Couch lose. But it's like, it's a consistent comment that we get. So it's kind of funny that uh, he's been able to captivate so many people in the jiu-jitsu community and make them love him. I, and uh, personally, I love Jacob Couch too. I wonder what so. his DMs look like. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what the Hillbilly Hammers DMs look like. He's probably just annoyed. Like, I know a lot of women, unfortunately, get some shitty DMs. But I bet he gets a lot of shit in his You think so? I bet he does. A lot does. of people are trying to talk shit. Like, yeah. About the way he talks. Or yeah. like, God. This is such a nice dude. I remember like even just right down this hallway walking down and he was talking to me about like how much it meant to him to have an opportunity to go against somebody like Jared Dobb, not just the opportunity to go against him, let alone get a victory against him, which we saw him do in the semifinals of our November absolute. He found a heel hook victory against an ADCC silver medalist in Jared Dobb and just, just having a genuine conversation with him and like how thankful he was to have that opportunity. Like, I can't say anything bad about Jacob Couch, man. That, that I, I feel where those people are coming from on YouTube comments when they're like, it hurts to watch him lose. And it kind of hurt to watch him lose in a way. But also, I was super excited for Austin because Austin's equally as good of a guy. Yeah. Um, you know, returning champion in our Gi and Nogi Absolute coming up on August 14th. He won both of those back at our May Day event. Uh, six matches, six submissions. It'll be interesting insane. to see how he does in this upcoming one. Potential matches against Pat Downey. Maybe Mikey England coming back. Uh, he's just competing on that Stalemates uh, wrestling card the night before that's also here in Des Moines. So might try to convince him to jump back into our absolute and produce some viral YouTube videos. <laughs> D1 wrestler versus BJJ black belts. Yeah. So and outside of that, um, one thing I do want to do before we get going is give a huge shout out to the CEO of Stonks, Anthony <laughs> Hughes. He is a person for the plebs of this world. We'll dive into that a little bit later. But. Trying to get a, an endorsement here, sponsorship on the podcast, Stonks. Yep. All right. Let's work with it. I can definitely do a nice little ad for Stonks. Yep. Speaking so. of which, I got to do a little ad for Top Mount Apparel. We're going to maybe... After we wrap up here, I'll actually record something official. But Top Mount Apparel, um, awesome company that's had our back for the last... Two plus years, I believe the first event they ever did was the March event in 2019 out at Adventureland Palace Theater, Subspectrum 7. We talked about it a little bit before, those four marquee names that had competed, uh, Tex Johnson, Keith Krikorian, uh, Juni Acasio, and Hannah Sharp with the famous arm break uh, in our women's 135-pound division. But uh, again, top mount apparel. Can't say enough good things about these guys. Apparel company out of Illinois. And they will be the official sponsor of our women's Gi Absolute coming up on August 14th. $500 cash prize going to the women of the, or the winner of that bracket. We have Kendall Rusing, uh, I believe Jennifer Case out of uh, Kansas City. Um, Alexandra Peterson, another black belt out of the, uh, I don't want to say Chicago area, but probably Illinois area. And a handful of other tough females that will be coming in for that. Obviously, Kendall at this moment is definitely the favorite, but we'll see as the 
85% of registrations that come in during the final four weeks. I, I was actually looking at, at the previous events over the last year, and 85% of the registrations come in in the last four weeks. You're a bunch so, of procrastinating assholes. Please go register. It will make my life a lot less stressful, and I will appreciate it. But anyways, Kendall Rusing, obviously the, the, uh, the favorite in that advanced ski absolute, sponsored by Top Mount Apparel. Amazing people, pumped to have them back for another event. They'll be there with their awesome apparel, shorts, rash guards, t-shirts, hats, all the above. Um, but thank you to to Al at Top Mount Apparel and everybody over there that's had our backs over the last two years. Can't say again enough good things about those guys. And anything else you'd like to mention before we wrap this up? Uh, still no salmon colored shorts during the summer. Please, please don't do it. Looking at you, Jet. <laughs> Yeah, All right, it. ladies and gentlemen, that's episode four of the Subspectrum BJJ podcast. Uh, please like this podcast. Please comment. Please share with your friends who you think would be interested in the Subspectrum BJJ podcast. And feel free to drop a comment about anything that you'd like to see on the show or just anything that we talked about in this episode. Obviously, comments drive the YouTube algorithm. More views means more watch time, means more average view duration, means more money that we can apply to awesome things at Subspectrum BJJ. So please do that. Subscribe if you haven't already. My name's Jordan Peitzman. I'm Derek Flagg. We're out. <laughs>